Wario might be the most popular, unpopular protagonist in video games. It's been over a decade since he starred in his own platformer, and today he's better known for being the face of microgame collections. But for those in the know, Wario is as important to the tapestry of video games as his doppelganger, Super Mario. At least in my opinion. Over the course of this channel's history, I've spoken quite candidly about my adoration for Wario. As a character, he appeals to my anarchic spirit, not motivated by loyalty to the crown, nor vague notions of saving the world, rather he's in it for the bag, something that all of us can empathise with, whether it's having enough to make ends meet, or just living luxuriously. Wario Land 4, the uh, fourth portable game in the series, is my favourite platform game of all time, which led me to documenting a number of independent titles that took influence directly from it. I've also spoken at length about the WarioWare games and the titles they inspired. But until now I've yet to fully dive into the first Wario game I fell in love with. My fascination with Wario started just as Nintendo perfected the formula, resulting in a game that combined the best of all of their design principles. Did you know that there's a Wario game just as innovative as his later work, stashed away on the Game Boy Color? Let's talk about Wario Land 3. Wario Land 3 was the full realisation of an experiment Nintendo R&D 1 began with Super Mario Land. In attempting to adapt the appeal of Super Mario Bros. onto a portable device, they ultimately developed a platform game that went beyond mimicking Mario, and truly utilised what made portable gaming unique. Wario provided an opportunity for his developers to experiment with a new genre they had originally pioneered long before Super Mario Land, one which would go on to be a dominating force in the world of video games. Not only is Wario Land 3 the evolution point of the Super Mario platformer, but it's also secretly as influential as 1994's Super Metroid, the game that kicked off the Metroidvania craze. These are bold claims, but they're true. In this video I will show you how Nintendo perfected the idea for Wario Land 3 over a decade of iterations and innovation, and why his third Game Boy Adventure is the perfect template for other developers to innovate on, just as they have done with Super Mario and with Super Metroid. So let's start at the start. Released in the year 2000, Wario Land 3 is the third portable entry in the Wario Land series, itself spun off from the third game in the Super Mario Land series. Here our titular treasure hunter finds himself trapped inside a music box, where a mysterious voice beckons him to find five music boxes to break the curse on his magic powers. In exchange he'll send Wario back home and let him keep any treasure he finds. That last part is all the motivation Wario needs to accept the offer. It's not exactly the work of Shakespeare, but as you'd expect from a Game Boy game, Wario Land 3 story plays out in player actions, rather than extensive cutscenes. Wario Land 3 is not a linear obstacle course to a flagpole. Instead, the world inside the music box is split into four regions across the cardinal directions, 25 levels and four objectives to complete in each. Although the world map calls to mind Super Mario Bros. 3, the structure of the game has more in common with Super Mario 64 and Super Metroid. Wario Land 3 was developed after both, and is the clearest example of translating the appeal of Mario 64 from 3D to 2D. Like Mario's foray into three dimensions, Wario has free reign in his environment. There's no flagpoles here, just four chests and four matching keys. You can't get these keys from just moving left or right. Some require Wario to fight a boss, solve a puzzle, play a golfing minigame, or, borrowing from Metroid's design, return at a later time with a new power-up. Wario starts the game as weak as he does in the first Wario Land, but by the end of the game exceeds the abilities he had in Wario Land 2. This includes the ability to smash through solid rocks with his biceps, his head, and his butt. Another callback to Mario 64. Like a new missile or morph ball upgrade in Super Metroid, these permanent upgrades open up paths in previous levels once unreachable, 
adding additional dimension to explore. It makes some sense that Wario Land 3 would feel like a Metroid game. Both games and series were made by Nintendo Research and Development 1, and they share a number of key staff members. The director of Wario Land 3, Takahiko Hosokawa, led the design of Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Artist Hiroki Kiyotake was responsible for the design of both Wario and Samus Aran in the original Metroid. The two series also share a similar design ethos. Metroid and Wario were designed through creative restriction. That restriction? Making 2D platformers that didn't just repeat the successes of Super Mario. Metroid became Metroid through sheer accident. The title was the first project by two Game & Watch developers for the NES. Production began just after the release of Super Mario Bros. in 1986, and the designers had ideas on how to improve on their release. Their game would be a science fiction epic, inspired by Ridley Scott's Alien, where a space hunter would have a vast array of weapons to fight cool monsters with. There was just one problem. After months of development, no game had materialised. The designers had created character and enemy sprites, animations and elaborate obstacle courses to complete, but there was nothing to do. In order to get the project over the finish line, the tandem developers grew into the entire Nintendo R&D 1 team, led by Game Boy designer Gunpei Yokoi. Rather than start the project from scratch in this minuscule time frame, the team had to figure out a game from what they had. It was decided that players would be required to traverse these enormous levels multiple times, to maximise their usefulness. To encourage that one to explore were all those weapons the original designers had developed. It was in those last few weeks that Metroid became Metroid, a mix of Super Mario's side-scrolling action with The Legend of Zelda's item-driven exploration. R&D 1 developed on the concept with two more games with Metroid reaching its supposed potential with 1994's Super Metroid for the SNES, the game that inspired Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and subsequently every Metroidvania game since. The third Metroid was the chef's kiss of an entire design philosophy, and Nintendo R&D 1 pulled the same trick off nearly half a decade later with Wario Land 3. Though I'm getting ahead of myself. What Super Metroid and Wario Land 3 have in common is that they're games about exploration. The former game has a large map that slowly expands as Samus gains new abilities, and the same is true for Wario. For example, gaining the ability to swim opens up not just entirely new levels, but new parts of previously explored ones, just like the gravity suit of Super Metroid does. Unlike Mario, Samus can actually take a hit, and the same is true for Wario who's even more of a tank. Simply put, Wario cannot be hurt. Enemies either stun him or transform him. Platform game staples like bottomless pits are also eliminated entirely. What this means is that Wario has literally nothing to lose during his adventure, encouraging the one to go everywhere and do everything. Progress in Wario Land 3 is also handled slightly differently, and better fitting for a portable game. In Super Metroid, players must manually make a save at designated points throughout an adventure, and dying a Samus will cost them time. Levels in Wario Land 3 aren't interconnected like the map of Metroid, but instead follow the function of a Mario overworld. They can be beaten in a few minutes, just like an obstacle course of a Super Mario game. And every time Wario does so, the game makes an automatic battery save. The only progress lost by time is on a level by level basis. Usually when a boss sends Wario out of an arena, resulting in a 20 second walk back to the fight. In short, there's no time to waste or viable resources to squander, and so Wario and the player can focus entirely on treasure hunting. Although the two games are going for different tones, ultimately I like Wario Land 3's take on exploration more. It's bite sized, meaning I can binge as much or as little as I want per play session. Because of the world map, level aesthetics and challenges change more frequently, unlike a Metroid game where I might be stuck in a lava zone for over an hour. The world also has more variety than Planet Zebras also. Fans of Super Metroid likely remember the moment they restored power to the wrecked ship, which led to a change in challenges. 
Super Mario 64 also experimented with changing levels aesthetically and mechanically, depending on what objectives had been previously completed, how Mario entered a painting, or by playing around with gizmos within. Mario Land 3 picks up where Mario left off and takes this concept to new heights. On the lower end, finding an axe as a treasure at the end of the game's first world opens up the path to a new level. But then, some treasures cause enormous pools of water to appear, reveal hidden castles, and even blow up holes in mountainsides. It's silly, but the logic is sound. It keeps exploration fresh, just as you're used to an obstacle course, a small tweak can flip it on its head. It doesn't make levels longer, or even make previous chests unattainable, but what it does do is get you wondering about all the extra dimensions the game has to offer, just as the paintings of Mario 64 did, or the unexplored regions of Zebes in Super Metroid. How Wario Land 3 became a game about exploration wasn't a result of Metroid's popularity. In actuality, Metroid has never been that popular, and the Metroidvania boom only happened around the 2010s, with Steam and XBLA opening opportunities for indies to make their own adventures inspired by Super Metroid. Rather, Wario Land 3 could be thought of as a final iteration on an experiment that began nearly a decade prior. How do you transpose Super Mario Bros. onto a portable device? Super Mario Land was developed by Nintendo R&D 1 as a launch title for the Game Boy back in 1989. Simply, it was a declaration that the home console experience of Super Mario Bros. could be properly emulated on a portable device, with a monochromatic screen and other hardware downgrades from the NES. The team had to reimagine some of Super Mario's most identifiable elements to make this transition work. Sprites are smaller, levels are simpler in design, and expected power-ups and enemy behaviours are tweaked to circumvent programming limitations. These concessions had to be made so that Super Mario's most important facet remained – fast-paced platformer action. To put in perspective what Land achieved, we only have to compare it with 1999's Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, a more straightforward port of the NES original for the Game Boy Color. The screen size of the Game Boy Color was not a good fit for a game designed for 4x3 televisions. Rather than redraw Super Mario Bros. sprites as R&D 1 had done previously, the developers instead punched in the camera, greatly reducing the amount of information a player could see. For instance, World 1-1 doesn't just scroll to the left and right in the remake, but up and down as well. This isn't initially a problem, but in the later game portions, and especially its more difficult sequel, blind jumps and hidden obstacles become a frequent annoyance. Super Mario Land, despite its antiquated look, doesn't suffer from these issues, because it was made with the Game Boy's 160x144 resolution in mind. It might be hard to communicate this achievement on YouTube in 2023, but Super Mario Land succeeds because it played into the Game Boy's limitations, not recreating the NES game on a surface level, but instead porting the thrill that made Mario a household name. However, for the next game in the Mario Land series, R&D 1 decided to make a game that looked more like people expected. 1992's Six Golden Coins took inspiration from the look of 1991's Super Mario World, but rendered monochromatic. Because of the increase in sprite detail, platforming was somewhat more simplified. The game is slower paced, and floatier than previous Mario adventures. It works, but it doesn't make a great case for Super Mario on the Game Boy. It's not nearly as fun as its Super Nintendo brethren. Well, the Game Boy housed much better alternatives. To know, both Super Mario Lands were bestsellers, likely due to the strength of the Mario brand. But they weren't killer apps. That honour went to some heavyweights you might be familiar with. One was the pack-in title Tetris, a fast-paced puzzle game designed to be played in bite-sized sessions. The other was Pokemon, a slower paced JRPG that got juice from battling and trading between other players. Rather than continue to push Super Mario in a format he didn't fit, R&D 1 decided to create a character that could be designed around the Game Boy's strengths and limitations, just as Tetris and Pokemon were. To do so, they settled on the villain of the second Super Mario Land game.
Wario Land 3 carries over control set in the first game and polished in the second. Wario is a corruption of Mario, both in name and visuals, and with that came a number of design opportunities. Because he's fatter and more muscular, his jumps are shorter, but he has an offensive barge and throwing ability that complements his horizontal movement. Thus the annoyance of lining up a Mario-like jump off screen is avoided. Carrying over his personality from six golden coins, Wario is a treasure hoarder. Unlike its Mario predecessors, you need to collect coins in Wario Land 1, both to finish levels and get the best ending. In 2 and 3, treasure is given even more emphasis. To make exploration all the more entertaining, treasure could be hidden above, below and inside obstacles. As there's no longer the threat of bottomless pits, players are all the more encouraged to go beyond just the intended path. And then finally, there's Wario's signature transformations. Because he can't take harm, instead certain enemies alter Wario's physical form. For example, being stung by a floating jellyfish causes Wario's face to puff up, and his body to slowly float up to the ceiling. Transformations aren't a straightforward improvement the same way the power-ups are. Rather, they're a hindrance or a help depending entirely on the situation. To go back to the jellyfish example, they might help Wario reach a key floating on the ceiling. The player just needs to make sure that Wario is stung in the right place. Transformations were introduced in Wario Land 2, but because of that game's Mario-like obstacle course structure, they didn't quite get the opportunity to shine. In Wario Land 3, with its Super Mario 64 and Metroid-like structure, they're part of the puzzle-solving tapestry. They are in miniature what the entire game is about, Wario having a specific set of skills and the player being asked to intuit the path forward in a mini sandbox. How can Wario on fire solve this one task? Or Vampire Wario? Or even Snowball Wario? Arguably, Wario Land 3 didn't need permanent upgrades to be satisfying because of these additional transformations, but neither did they cause conflicts. Instead, they act like new chapters of the game, charting how both Wario and the player are progressing. It goes to show that the game really is a calling card for all the best tricks R&D 1 learnt over the years. Wario Land 3 is Wario at his best. At least until his Game Boy Advance outing a year later. It's here where all of R&D 1's experimentation with the platformer format finally pay off. As stated, Wario no longer takes harm like Super Mario, and as such there's no longer a need for a life system. There's also no longer a need to track time. He's exploring mini Metroid levels, and rushing a player through them would be detrimental to the one to explore. Coins are important, but not as they were previously. They don't unlock level endings like in Wario Land 1, or feed into progression like Wario Land 2. Instead, they're used to buy turns on a minigame that occasionally feeds into one of the quests. As a result, nothing needs to be tracked by a UI, and so there isn't one. Screen real estate is given completely over to Wario, and so there's nothing to take attention away from the game's excellent visuals. Using the full hardware grunt of the Game Boy Color, the levels inside the music box all drip with excellent detail, charming enemy sprites and funny animations. A little like Donkey Kong for the Game Boy, it evokes a playable cartoon, with each level an objective like an episode of Wario's Adventure. The soundtrack also evolves on R&D 1's work from Wario Land onwards. In the second game, composer Hip Tanaka experimented with a familiar melody across levels, remixing and experimenting with it as a means to create differentiation. The Wario Lands keep up this tradition, and it's in free where the concept is fully realised. For example, the same bouncy, playful melody of the introductory level is turned sinister when Wario visits a castle full of zombies. It's a reflection on how the game keeps the same core mechanics, but a player is asked to use them in new ways to achieve Wario's goals. In summation, Wario Land 3 was the end of R&D 1's experiments with the appeal of Mario on the Game Boy, and it's where their work shines the brightest. They figured out how to make big, appealing sprites work on portable devices, not by focusing on how they looked or animated, but by making the gameplay work around them. No bottomless pits, no unseen obstacles, instead games about exploration and experimentation. They knew that Game Boy players would enjoy a round of Tetris or a Pokemon battle more often than several Super Mario levels, and so made Wario Land 3 a game of short objectives to complete, 
all of which end on a tease for something cool. A new power-up, place to explore, or progress towards the end goal. Even when players have collected enough treasures to face the final boss, there's still plenty more to be discovered, leading to three entirely new levels, boasting ideas unlike anything seen previously. Is the secret exit of Super Mario World taken to a logical endpoint? And a tease at the extra game content Nintendo would experiment with from Super Mario Galaxy onwards. Wario Land 3 was well received, and according to Wikipedia, is the 25th best selling game on the Game Boy. Not a bad achievement considering it came out a year before the Game Boy Advance. It was there that we got a sequel, which didn't exactly expand on Wario Land 3, but instead reimagined it around new hardware. Because of the widescreen of the GBA, Wario decided to use his shape-shifting powers to turn into a speedrunner, leading to Wario Land 4. A great game that, well, I've spoken about plenty of times before. But Wario's influence wouldn't end here. Nintendo R&D 1 took an 8-year break away from the Metroid franchise following Super Metroid. Although there's no documented reasons why, I have a couple of theories. Super Metroid was something of a remake of the first game, but with a hardware grunt of the SNES. That first game came out of a troubled development and subsequently created a new genre. Now with the time to properly realise it, R&D 1 would perfect the Metroid concept with this third outing. But how then do you innovate on perfection? Plenty of developers since have tried to varying degrees of success, but it seemed too big of a task for R&D 1 to figure out in the immediate aftermath. It's also just as likely that R&D 1 were full steam on developing Game Boy games, taking attention away from a potential N64 Metroid title, and as stated, Wario was a better seller than Metroid. But it was through experimenting with Wario that R&D 1 would figure out a solution to Metroid. The original team at this point had been replaced with new blood, and so they took what they had learned with Wario Land 3 and 4 into this new iteration of Metroid. It was a portable game, and so that episodic design of Wario was applied. Samus Aran would still have a big map to explore, but there would be some restrictions in place. The opportunity of this would be a world that would shift and change more often than Super Metroid did, just like the world of Wario Land 3. This work would culminate in Metroid Fusion, the inspiration and prequel to the Switch's Metroid Dread. This fourth game in the series didn't just replicate the successes of Super Metroid on ill-fitting hardware, much like Nintendo had tried with Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, but instead Fusion took on the opportunities of the Game Boy Advance to evolve the formula. Despite the Metroidvania genre being so locked at the design of Super Metroid, R&D 1 have shown that the series had room to evolve, just like the Wario games had previously done. If you go to Steam right now and search by the tag Metroidvania, you'll get over 1300 results back. But if you search by the tag Wariovania, you'll get zero results. This is probably because I made the term up, but I hope the developers look at Wario Land 3 for inspiration on how to evolve in the platform game next. Wario Land 3 was a game born from limitations, a space where R&D 1 thrived. After all, they were led by the late Gunpei Yokoi, the father of the Nintendo Game Boy, a portable NES with a four-color LCD display that lasted only a few hours on battery. Despite that, it was home to a number of brilliant games that thrived either in spite of or because of those limitations. It's hard to imagine developers today being hamstrung by those same limitations, especially when free engines like Unity are responsible for enormous MMOs like Genshin Impact. But just because you can make a game like that doesn't mean it's a good fit for everyone. I love Wario Land 4 because of my particular makeup, but Wario Land 3 is a great fit for those who love the idea of a Metroidvania but want the bite-sized nature of Super Mario levels. It's a great fit for those who want to enjoy a platform game that isn't built around bottomless pits and off-screen obstacles eating into their health, because it instead gives them space to explore and find something cool. It's a great fit for those who want protagonists who both look and act like goblins, because it leads to fun gameplay opportunities. But that's not to say that modern technology couldn't expand on the concepts, at least a little bit. 
Wario Land 4 would eventually do a speedrun version of Wario Land 3, and WarioWare Get It Together would apply the Wario Land control scheme to a minigame collection. And so I guess my message to developers is, like Nintendo R&D 1, look at the opportunities of Wario Land 3 and ask, where can we go next?